The world is dark. It seems like there's so much hate. Violence continues to increase. Mass shootings have become almost a common occurrence. So many people think it's okay to kill unborn children. The sex trade just continues to grow with teens and even young children abducted and abused. Families continue to get ripped apart. In a day and age in which we seem to have personal computers in the palm of our hands, social media at our fingertips, we're probably more alone than ever. People are mistreated because of their skin color, their nationality, their gender, their economic status, among many other things. And all of us left to pursue happiness any way that we might be able to find it. And in the beginning of Scripture, Genesis in chapter 1, we see these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without form, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. See, the only solution, the only answer for darkness is light. And that really is the story of Christmas, that that in Christmas we celebrate a Savior who stepped out of His glory in heaven and into our dark world to shine His amazing light. He said, light, if we're honest about it, we can see it's good. We use it all over the place, right? Because it separates the darkness. We use it in our homes. You know, when we need to get up and use the restroom at night and we don't want to trip over that thing, you know, that's in our way. We use it when we're trying to dig into our closets to find that perfect pair of shoes for the Christmas service at church. We use it in our cars and our headlights as we travel around to see our family, our loved ones. We've been using it in transportation in a variety of ways for a long period of time. Boats have these these things called lighthouses that help them to look out for dangerous objects that they need to avoid. Airplanes are looking for these, these strobe lights, really, at airports so they know where to land. And when they get there, they see the, the runway just light up. Even Santa, one foggy Christmas Eve, needed a little light. You see, the only answer for darkness is light. And I think deep down we probably we understand that. Right? We we know what light is. We know how to use light. We know what a flashlight looks like and, and maybe even how to light a candle when the power goes out. And it seems like though all of us have this this inward desire to try to seek personal enlightenment. And it's based completely upon our own efforts and what we can accomplish. And we think that maybe if I can just learn enough, then I will be enlightened. But then we realize that there's always more to learn. That if, if I get engaged with the arts and I, I find a true expression of my inward self, that in that I will find enlightenment. That if, if I can just help with, with technology, if I stay on the cutting edge of technology, then in that I will find hope in this world of darkness. That maybe if I, if I meditate, that somehow inside of me, light will come forth. And maybe in some sort of mysticism, that somehow we can channel this light. Some of us have even gone as far as to think that government and political candidates and parties can bring us light. Maybe if we make enough, 
that will shine some light into our life. Maybe if I have enough, enough money, enough stuff, enough success. But the reality is that this darkness is so deep that you and I, based upon our own efforts, cannot illuminate it. And in reality, the more we try, the more we realize just how dark it is. And our quest for personal enlightenment, it too has left us empty and shaded from the truth. But the only answer, the only hope in darkness is light. It really is. Because it really is that bad. We really do mess things up. The world really is dark. But Christmas tells us that there's hope. That there is light. Isaiah, a prophet of God in his word, tells us about this light years before Jesus is born. In the Bibles we provide, it's on page 573, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. And you and I today live in a land of deep darkness. Maybe not ourselves personally. Maybe we have accepted that light, but there are many who are lost, wandering aimlessly in that dark. Maybe you can think of one or two. Maybe that person wandering aimlessly in the dark. Maybe that's you. And a light has shone upon them. It's kind of like, you know, by day three, of relentless, overcast days when we're tired. Like we've just had our 15th cup of coffee and outside of using the restroom, we just can't keep our eyes open. We're crabby, irritable. So looking for some sort of hope, life. And it comes the moment that we see a ray of sunlight peeking through the clouds. And on those days and those moments, it's almost as like that is the most exciting thing that could happen in eternity is that the clouds would part and the sun would shine through. It's having that morning cup of coffee and watching the sun rise over the horizon. And you see this sun, this light, it is dawned on us. It's not within us, but it has come upon us. And that's what Isaiah is foretelling. But it's not just a light that he's talking about. If we skip down just a couple of verses, in verse 6 he says this, For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. Each one of these names specifically refer to God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And now they're given to describe this child which has been given to us. This child that will be a light dawning upon this dark world with its rays extending into our deep darkness. But what kind of child could capture the character of God and shine this powerful light into all of our stuff. Well, we see that in the book of John. John is definitely my favorite Christmas narratives. Now, if you're not familiar with God's Word, there are four books we call them the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they share with you the story of Jesus. Now, some of those stories, as we've been in Matthew, kind of talk about the history 
The, the account that this was indeed a Jewish man. And then you get to Luke, the most prominent of the, the narrative accounts, talks about this, this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a manger. John is way more abstract than that. And he shares these words, John chapter 1, verse 1, page 886 in the Bibles we provide. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that has been made. It's like we go back to Genesis again. And God said His Word. And without His Word, nothing was made that has been made. And in the beginning, Jesus, that Word was there. And God said, let us make man in our image. And then He says this in verse 4. In Him was life. And that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You see something powerful about this divine light from God through Jesus is that as it penetrates into the darkness, the darkness cannot do anything to stand against it. But the darkness stretches in and it provides hope and joy and life in tremendous and powerful ways. We enjoy light. We enjoy the things that it offers, that it brings to us. Right? Because it brings us maybe peace. Maybe some joy. I mean, lights have been long associated with Christmas. Christmas. Right from the very first Christmas trees that were actually chopped off the top of a tree and hung upside down in living rooms and had candles on them. Sounds safe, doesn't it? But the little twinkle of light just seems to bring joy and a smile, even from a distance. And you set it up to the Trans-Siberian Orchestra and everybody's happy. Lights across the house in our yard. Some look like a snowman. And others, maybe a jolly old elf. But as we look upon them, and some of them, you know, we like to go out and just kind of take a tour and, and see those lights. Those are my favorite ones, you know, the ones I didn't have to put up. <laughs> and I didn't this year. Some of my family took care of that for me. But this light is, it's amazing the joy and the hope that it brings. Right, that this is something that we can't do on our own, but it only comes because the light has dawned. It's coming from the outside and reaching inside. It makes a difference. So Jesus, according to this passage, and I'll read a little bit more of you, it to you, Jesus is the child in Isaiah chapter 9. The child that brings light into a world of darkness. And in that we can find hope and healing. See, it's not just that. There was a man, his name was John. Not John, the disciple of Christ who wrote this, but John the baptizer, who was a cousin of Jesus that went before Jesus in his birth order and in his ministry. And it says in a couple of passages here in chapter 1, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through Him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. So his job was to tell other people that the light is coming. And it says in verse 14, and the Word, chapter 1, verse 1, became flesh and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, God with us. And we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was of whom I said, He who comes after Me ranks before Me because He was before Me. How is this even possible? John was born first. He ministered first. How did Jesus come before? Because the Word 
was there in the beginning. And the Word is the mighty God. There in the beginning, without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life is the light of all mankind. And so John understood that even though He was coming before, that Jesus had already come before Him both in order of creation, and Jesus was not. He was God. And in supremacy, importance in life. So he knew about this. And so John confirms that in fact this, this Jesus, this baby, this is the Son of God. Isaiah chapter 9. But if not just the words of John, how about the words of Jesus Himself just a few pages later? John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows Me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus affirms this very thing, that I, in fact, am the light of the world. That baby, that baby was me, I'm not a baby, I am the light. And I have reached into your darkness. And so Jesus can step in and He can replace our spiritual darkness. You know, all of our brokenness and our addictions, and the things that are holding us back, the things that are causing us to be spiritually blinded. In that Jesus, we can find hope. So I don't know what it is that's holding you back. Maybe, maybe you've heard this message a thousand times before. Yada, yada, yada. Christmas, Jesus, get gifts, move on. But, so maybe... You need to hear it with fresh ears for the first time. That God, the Creator of all things, took on flesh. The Word became flesh. Lived among us. He understands the stuff that we're going through. He's lived in this life. He's dealt with the struggles. Right? And no matter what your struggle is, He wants to be there for you. So is your struggle with power. Is your struggle with humility? Is it with an addiction? Sex, drugs, alcohol? Is it with prominence? Is it with cash and possessions? Whatever the case, Jesus can shine a light into that darkness. But on the flip side of that, try as you might to enlighten yourself to break free and you'll probably find yourself even deeper in darkness. But good news for you, Jesus stepped into your darkness. Isaiah chapter 53, page 614. Isaiah the prophet goes on to share some more information about this Jesus. It says in verse 4, Surely He has borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds we are healed. All, we like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to His own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. The basic prayer phrase is this. That you and I have all messed up. We've all wandered away and we've all done our own thing. But God sent that baby as a light into the world to shine into our dark places. And instead of throwing a party and being ecstatic about it, we beat Him we abused Him, and we crucified Him. Now you're probably thinking, well, I wasn't there. What do you mean? I didn't do anything. How many times have we been presented with the truth, the hope, the love of the Gospel message, and we've turned our back on Jesus? And He's given everything. He stepped out of His heavenly dwelling and into our world of darkness, really to become darkness. It says in Matthew, 
one of the other Gospels, written by one of the other followers of Jesus. Matthew in chapter 27. Verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. This is referring to Jesus when He died on the cross, crucified for us. In His death, darkness was over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani. That is, my God. My God, why have You forsaken Me? You see, the Creator took on flesh and he wasn't just born as a baby, but he died in our place. He became our darkness. So on to say in First Peter, another one of Jesus' followers, page 1015, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you, get this, out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. For all of those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that that little baby that we celebrate this time of year in fact is the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Wonderful Counselor, that He is God. He was there in the beginning and He has humbled Himself and stepped into our world, into our darkness, and in fact became darkness taking the weight of our sin upon His shoulders, gives us hope, gives us light, and gives us life again through Jesus. See, Jesus, Jesus, when He's shown into the world at Christmas time, is more than just a little party, an excuse for families to get together, to go out and buy some presents, wrap them up, and gift them to one another. And I know as exciting as that can be, there's more to this. And the more, the more is hard. Right? Because we want to hear that there's hope. We want to hear that there's a Savior. We want to hear that there is a light reaching into our darkness. But the reality is, more often than not, we're not ready for it. More often than not, we push it away. We run and hide from it. We don't want that light to illuminate into our life the things that we've messed up. The wrongs that we continue to commit. And so rather than bringing ourselves into the light, we hide in the corners. And we say, yes, I want a Savior. But I don't want to live in the light. Because that's hard. So it challenges us. And sometimes we'd rather live in this deception that we can fix it ourselves. Sometimes we would choose to think that, that I can pursue things that will make me happy. Or that if I just ignore it, it'll go away. But Jesus brings to us another challenge. It exists in two parts. The first part is this. Maybe the hardest step you'll ever take. And the easiest at the same time. Give up. Give up. Now, I'm not saying give up on life, give up on hope, give up on opportunities, give up on joy, give up on a future. I'm saying give up trying to fix it yourself. Give up trying to control the whole thing. Give up trying to, to win at all costs based on your own merits. And give in. Give in not to what you can do, but what Jesus has already done for you. <laughs> it sounds so easy. Like, what, you mean I don't have to do anything? Dude, I got this all day long. But in reality, it's the hardest thing. To admit that I can't control it. I can't do it. I can't win it. I can't be good enough, better enough but that everything I do 
keeps me in the dark. But the good news, there is hope. Because a light shines in the darkness. And the darkness, the darkness can't hold it off. It's a penetrating light. It's a powerful light. Listen to these words in John chapter 1, starting with verse 9. Verse 9 tells us, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him. Yet the world did not know Him. He created. He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jesus came to give light, but the reality is the very people He came to shine it for oftentimes reject Him. My guess is that over these three Christmas services, we will have somebody, or probably multiple someones, who've come here and they're calloused by the world, calloused by education, calloused by their own advances, calloused by their personal experiences at home or with another church. And in that process, you have put up a wall. And the very light that's trying to reach in to free you, you have blocked out. And Jesus still shines His light for you and I. Even in those moments. Even in those moments, there's hope. But I want to take you back to these words of Isaiah. For unto us, a son is born. A child is given. It's a gift. We just have to receive it. Today you have the opportunity to receive it. Maybe for the very first time. Or maybe like many of us, you've once walked in the light, but life kind of got the better of you. And you've wandered and you've strayed and you've done your own thing. And you're lost. And now this is a time to come back to the light. So here's what I believe are some next steps for us to take. Number one is this. Stop. Stop trying to fix it yourself. Trust. Trust in what Jesus has already done for you. And probably the harder step is walk. Walk in the light as He as is in the light. Now if you're not careful, you can get these jumbled up and out of order. And you think, if I just walk in the light enough, if I just do enough good, then Jesus will forgive me. And I'm here to tell you today, Jesus has already forgiven you if you'll receive the gift and you'll accept His light in your life. And then, instead of trying to earn your salvation, you're actually expressing the joy of your salvation. You're not doing these things because you have to. You're doing them out of a re relationship with God that overflows. And you're doing them because you want to. Stop trying to fix it. Trust in what Jesus has done and continue to walk in the light. Father, we thank You for allowing us the opportunity to step into that light, whether it was years ago or this very moment or the time has not yet come. You have given us the opportunity to experience grace, love, forgiveness. The opportunity to break free of our bondage, of our brokenness, of our addictions, and to step into Your marvelous light. And our prayer Father, is not that we would continue to celebrate Christmas as just another day or just another opportunity to get together with family, open gifts, eat a crazy amount of food, but that we could bask in the fact that the Savior of the world humbled Himself for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.